In my New England travels, I've always had a curiosity for really big rocks. But one thing I've never come across, one of these huge rocks, eons after the glacier, being picked up and moved. Until now, until Fitchburg. Looking not a day older than its 25,000 years, it sits now at its street level perch on the upper common. But once it commanded the heights and attention. In the period around 1900, people would come on the train and take their picture sitting on or near the boulder. But as Rollstone Hill became an active granite quarry, the big rock became a big problem. On the one hand, they love the boulder, they love that it's famous. On the other hand, You've got work to do. So they decide, okay, well, we can move this. And in 1929, they did by exploding it. And then you had to put it back together again, like a jigsaw puzzle. That couldn't have been easy. That was definitely not easy, but the city had a plan. No one here is more qualified to rhapsodize about the Rollstone Boulder than former local teacher and Fitchburg native, Peter Capadagli, who explains that before the rock was blown up, it was painted over with colors and markings. So when they did blow it up, they could bring the pieces down here and kind of match up lines and so, colors. And reassemble it here on the common where it's been a landmark ever since. But as Capadagli knows better than anyone, it's more than that. In 2008, he and his wife opened the Boulder Art Gallery, mere yards from the actual boulder itself. Yes, they promote local artists, but you'll also find nod after nod to the Rollstone Boulder as an outsized mascot for the city itself. Twice a year, Capadagli leads a rock walk, leading folks from the boulder back up Rollstone Hill to its original location, a testament to the enduring appeal of a very well-traveled rock. And it's the only one that's been blown apart to save it in the entire world. 60 miles southwest in South Hadley, a building that may not have moved as far as a glacial erratic, but with a unique history all its own. It's the Joseph Allen Skinner Museum at Mount Holyoke College, and has been described as one man's floor to ceiling cabinet of curiosities, more than 7,000 to be exact. I think people are shocked. Everybody meets this place in different ways. Joseph Allen Skinner was a wealthy silt magnate and benefactor of Mount Holyoke. He toured the world, collecting things of all types that intrigued him, emphasis on all. From the beginning, he had an intention for it to be a public museum. So it was open to the public. And I think he wanted to be able to share history in the world with mostly local people. That local interest extends to the 180-year-old building itself. Many visitors don't realize that its first life was as the first congregational church of Prescott, Mass., one of the four lost towns of the Quabbin Reservoir. So Aaron, talking about connecting with this original Prescott church, these original pews. Yeah. History, housing more history. Meanwhile, in Little Compton, Rhode Island, a collection of relics which could be in a museum if they weren't being bought up and brought back to life. Generally, it's people who are very disappointed with modern products, and eventually they land on the fact that many of these antique stoves were designed far better and far more efficiently than anything that's available today. That is the gospel on modern manufacturing, according to father and son, Emery and Brandon Pinio, whose antique stove hospital here reclaims, refurbishes, and repurposes century-old stoves, and the market for them has been increasing dramatically. I think it's growing because of the stove's durability. These antique stoves, at least the ones designed in New England, were intended to not have planned obsolescence built into the stove. Emery Pinio and his wife swapped out a relatively new modern stove for a decidedly more mature one. The stove that was here before this was off by 70 or 80 degrees in the oven. This one is off by two degrees. You have three more warming up, up here and zero built-in obsolescence. And here we have a two-sided radiant broiler. You can do both sides of a steak at the same time. So the irony is that this 90-year-old oven has features that a modern oven does not have. That's right, and I love the color. Not all of the old stoves here will be restored for new use. Some pieces really do belong in a museum. This is the oldest stove you got. In our collection, yes. This is late 1600s. Made of sheet iron in Europe and 
it was a mobile stove. When you think about the cost of making sheet metal, extremely, extremely expensive at the time period. So consequently, the stoves were made in such a fashion where one would be able to pick them up and move them from chamber to chamber rather than having multiple stoves in the home. Just an amazing piece of history. It's all an amazing effort, really. Recycling, restoring, and reusing some pretty basic elements of history, most of which are long gone. You start with something that's basically bound for the scrapyard and turn it into something that's useful, treasured actually. Wow. Since they started out in the 1970s, the Pinios estimate they've worked on more than 5,000 stoves and now operate their bu business full time. They also find some customers are looking not only for an antique style stove, but an antique style fuel source. The Pinios will not only refurbish a stove, but retrofit it so that it burns wood or even coal for customers looking to go a little bit more off the grid.